Bill Iceberg Lettuce Lifecycle Analysis, and Re-Envision Product System. Iceberg Lettuce got its current name because it gained popularity in the 20s when it was shipped across the country in ice containers. It became popular not for its nutritional value, but because Iceberg Lettuce is specifically well suited to be shipped across long distances in ice, and when it arrives it is usually still crisp and fresh. On a personal level, why did I choose Iceberg Lettuce? Well, over the past several years, my personal relationship with food has changed. This has been in large part driven by the fact that I started to cook and prepare my own food. I have even made some web recipes, such as the one here of me making kibbe. This interest has led me to want to know more about where my food comes from. I know I'm not the only one. This is a hot topic on the mind of many people in our country, including not only our First Lady, as well as many best-selling authors and community leaders. Iceberg lettuce is actually a type of crisp head lettuce. It is the most popular type of lettuce sold in the country. It has over 60% market share. It is also one of the least nutritious members of the lettuce family, though it is the one that travels the best. Iceberg lettuce is sold across a wide variety of channels and varieties. The unprocessed cellophane wrapped lettuce heads are still very common, though more recently, Processed varieties, such as the one from Dole that I chose uh, to do my research on, have continued to gain popularity. Currently, one quarter of all iceberg lettuce sold in the country is prepackaged in packages such as this. My objective in doing this research is to discover more sustainable alternatives to making fresh food accessible to all communities in New York City. It is hard to believe that in a city like New York, where we have so much wealth, there are communities that don't have access to healthy foods. A recent study showed that New York City um, found that there are over 3 million residents in areas of the city with low access to fresh foods. This study was done by the New York City Department of City Planning. So the functional unit of my study is one serving of leafy salad. This is not necessarily a serving of iceberg lettuce because an alternative system may actually provide the person with some different types of greens. So let's take a look at Dole Iceberg Lettuce. Um, me living in New York, I wanted to know how far does Dole Iceberg Lettuce travel to get to my plate. And I found out that Dole Iceberg Lettuce travels over 3,000 miles from point of origin to a supermarket in New York City. We're going to take a closer look at this journey. My main sources of information for this analysis were the Dole Corporate Public Documents and U.S. Food and Drug Administration, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the University of California Resources. It's important to note that Dole would refuse to get back to me regarding several questions I had, so I had to rely, for their perspective, solely on what information was available on their website and via their uh, public reporting. So let's start the journey. First, the lettuce is planted, grown, and harvested, and this happens in California and Arizona. Next up, the lettuce is shipped to the processing and packing plant where in Ohio, uh, this is where the, the packing plants exist, uh, the lettuce is clean cut and packaged for distribution. Inputs here include a lot of energy, water, as well as various chemicals used to clean the lettuce. The products that come out of this phase is the usable product itself already packaged and ready for shipping to retail centers as well as of course water waste, uh, solid waste, and other environmental wastes. Next up, uh, the lettuce goes to distribution and retail, and at this point it reaches New York. Uh, the, here in New York, the product probably goes somewhere like Hunts Point, or it gets delivered directly to supermarkets and other stores throughout the city. And, uh, and then this is where the consumer would encounter the product. Uh, during the use and reuse phase, also in New York, the lettuce would be purchased, brought home, and unpackaged for consumption. It would usually be unpackaged with multiple other foods because it is rare that you see somebody eating lettuce all on its own. The next phase is the waste management phase. After the consumption phase, uh, the plastic wrapping from the lettuce and other foods is thrown in the garbage. Leftover food sometimes is eaten, but other times is discarded. And um, uh, that pretty much kind of sums up the entire life cycle process of, of the current uh, dull iceberg uh, lettuce. And you know one of the things that, that becomes apparent uh, about this life cycle analysis is that this whole process is a direct result of Dole's uh, focus on maximizing operational efficiencies to lower production costs and on marketing innovations such as conveniently packaged salads. Uh, from reading all of their corporate statements, this seems to really be what they're 
um, focus is, you know, really providing things at the most efficient possible way. But there's little consideration for sustainability, though that has started to creep in over the last decade. Um, one of the, the thing that, that you can see is also in uh, the last 10 years that have been several breakouts of E. coli on various leafy vegetables, which have raised concerns regarding weaknesses in these type of centralized food systems, such as the one that Dole um, you know, uh, models the system after. And um, there's, of course, limited industry insight, uh, sorry, lim little um, industry oversight from the government as the industry mostly regulates itself. So in terms of the different levers of change that we can use to really impact uh, the ability of fresh foods reaching local communities, uh, we really need to create a different paradigm for the system uh, that we're creating. It needs to be a paradigm that really focuses on sustainability and accessibility rather than focusing on convenience and value uh, and efficiency. So um, what this means is that there would be fundamental changes in our food system that will require people to really alter their lifestyles and eating habits. So we're definitely asking for a lot, which means that you know the, the, the potential solution to this problem really needs to be well thought through. So uh, using the sustainable mind system, I compare the environmental impact of those production model with several different models, such as community-supported agriculture, food co-ops, and farmers market. Of course, the sustainable mind system is somewhat limited in its scope. However, um, uh, it does provide a, a good basis for looking at things such as the environmental impact of transportation. And one of the things that became loud and clear from uh, this research is that CSAs uh, was by far the most sustainable model uh, in regards to these transportation um, metrics. So one other thing though that really on a personal level interests me about CSAs is that these are self-organized neighborhood communities that have decided to take matters into their own hand uh, in regards to solving the food access issue. In the process, you know, they are creating a direct relationship with local farmers to cure their own fresh food and are playing an important role in also helping individuals adapt to a seasonal way of eating. So not only providing the food, but also providing the education and support that a community needs in order to migrate to this different kind of approach to eating. So this is where I decided to really focus my design efforts um, on the notion of empowering these self-organized neighborhood communities to form and create direct relationships to food suppliers of various forms. So what I envision is a system that enables city residents to form and join neighborhood communities that build direct relationships with local fresh food suppliers. I also want to extend these relationships beyond traditional consumer supplier paradigm by supporting post-consumption exchanges such as recycling of packaging and compost composting so that um, you know this direct link between the farmer as well and this group of city residents you know not only um, is able to secure them fresh food access but also enables them to create a symbiotic system where the farmer not only gets money but is also able to get other value from uh, taking part in this relationship. The core of the system uh, is the connective tissue that would link city residents to local farms and this connective tissue would have two layers. It would really have a human layer and a technical layer. The human layer would be comprised of nonprofit organ organizations such as the Just Foods um, and similar organizations that really support uh, the groups via education, workshops, conferences, and helping link the city residents to uh, the farmers. Um, this uh, human layer is also comprised of community members that help educate other members of their own community uh, in regards to how to adapt to a seasonal way of eating. From a technical perspective, uh, the technical layer is really an online service that would provide an access to a market where communities and food suppliers could meet. It would also provide administrative tools for community organizers to manage their organizations and social networking tools for communications between all stakeholders in any relationship. I do have to add a caveat here. I'm working on a project called FarmBridge that really kind of starts hitting on a lot of these things. And this is a project that I'm working with several other colleagues on a different class. And the colleagues that I'm working on with uh, that I definitely want to just kind of give them some credit here are Cindy Wong, Noah Waxman, and Tianwei Liu. So uh, you'll be seeing more about that project on our website soon. And so that's pretty much it in terms of uh, what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you very much.